introduce Thang and straight into the event. How does that work? Right. Perfect. Everyone ready? Ready. Perfect. Thank you. Adam, if you need me. Oh. Sure <laughs> Cheers, mate. Bye. We'll just wait for uh, the attendees to start coming in. Uh, it takes a minute for uh, for That's Zoom to load everyone. How my name is spelled? Uh, you should be able to I've got it. change it. You got it. It's close. Close, but not close, but no banana. <laughs> oh, you know, you have the banana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you all for joining the Young Fabians uh, and Labour Housing Group event with Thang and Debonair on uh, the future of Labour's housing policy. Hi Thang and thanks for joining us. Hi everyone. Thanks uh, for having the young, me. All good. The Young Fabians is a member-led organisation that I have the pleasure of chairing. We've got projects underway looking into the ethical use of AI, Labour's culture war, an alternative health manifesto, Redefining Progress, Happiness versus GDP, Labour's Vision for COP26, a project on accessibility of politics in the 21st century. And this event is actually the 46th in our Zoom series. Wow. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, with events happened and events going on, over 20 shadow ministers join us, which is fantastic level of engagement with an active blog and a brilliant uh, level of engagement. So thank you to everyone who's been to our events before uh, and thank you to those planning on coming to those in the future. Please do have a look on our website, uh, youngfabians.org.uk for more. Uh, the hashtag for this event is hashtag Fabian Housing. Uh, you can find the Young Fabians uh, on Twitter at Young Fabians and the Labour Housing Group is at Labour Housing Group. Um, Thank you all very much for uh, taking part. I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you. Hi guys, and welcome Fangham. And just by way of introduction, my name's Chris Worrell and I'm a member of both the Young Fabians and the Labour Housing Group. I work in the land acquisition team for a later living developer and I sit as a non-exec director of a housing charity focused on women fleeing domestic abuse and chair a local residents association. Um, Fangham, thanks for coming and it's been a very, very popular event for Young Fabians. Most of our members, what they like to do with these things is hear a bit more about how you got into politics, your journey, um, and what makes you tick. Wow. I mean, it's, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, if my gaze isn't quite right, I'm trying to get used to Zoom and I've tried to position the Word document with my notes on it just below the camera, but I've already given up on the Word document. I think you, the, what got me into politics and what makes me tick? Um, they're sort of coterminous, those answers, because what got me into politics and what, make, what makes me tick is that, like I think probably most politicians and most political, uh, politically active people, most members of the Labour Party, I just wanted to make the world a better place. And I know that's really corny, um, but yeah, it is so. And why else would anybody get up and go campaigning or go knock on doors in December and it's raining and it's cold for a general election? And why would any of us do the things we do if we didn't genuinely believe that we could actually make the world a better place? And also not just believe that we could and we should, but that it, it really can happen, that actually campaigning is how you make the world a better place. And if nobody had ever campaigned, where would we be? I mean, women wouldn't have the vote. Uh, most working class people wouldn't have the vote. Uh, well, loads of things. We could just go back in time, couldn't we, if there hadn't yeah. been campaigns. So how did I get into politics? Um, well, I was born into a very Labour family. My grandparents were both trade unionists, working class people who worked my grandfather on the assembly line at the Cowley Works in Oxford. And my grandmother was a nurse and I was brought up. They were active in the co-op party, the Labour Party and their trade union movement. And my grandfather was a Labour councillor. And a story about my grandparents that always haunted me and is probably one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing now is... Of the two of them, I love them both ever so much, but my grandmother, in my view, was the brains of the operation, and it was the sort of time when women rarely got the opportunity to stand for elected office, very rarely. 
and my grandfather was always the one who was assumed to be the one that would stand for council and stand for trade union rep and all those things and in the end um, he was asked if he would stand for election in a parliamentary election and he said that he couldn't do that because he was a working man and he couldn't afford to take the time off work and that story really haunted me on two levels one because he would have been a great mp but two that nobody had asked my grandmother who would have been an even better mp <laughs> and she always used to whisper to me in my ears uh, not very subtly uh, a don't get married she whispered that bit i don't think she wanted my grandfather to hear but b make sure you fight for what you believe in and that if you really want to that you can make a difference it's not always the difference that you expected to but you can make a difference and she was just brilliant she would, she would campaign on the bus i mean that, that that woman would talk to a stranger about why they should vote <laughs> labor in the bus queue so she inspired me and i also i'm mixed race and i come from my so the that's my uh, english side of me and my indian side my dad got on a boat a one-way ticket when he was 17 got off the boat he was 18. Uh, his parents had sold everything they had to give him a ticket it was in the sort of time the uh, early 50s when people did that and um, so my dad was a first generation immigrant who i think really struggled in this country and never wanted to admit it um, but also um, wanted me to to see the world as an opportunity to make a better make a difference in, and that's right. just really stayed with me. Amazing! Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I suppose that might help us segue into just explaining for the young Fabian members out there what is the role of um, the Shadow Secretary of State for Housing and and how, what sort of uh, issues are they going to be? So the actual Secretary of State for Housing is a man called Robert Jenrick and he's the actual Secretary of State because unfortunately for us the Tories hammered us in the last general election and they got a massive majority and it pains me every time I have to admit that so my job as Shadow Secretary of State for Housing is literally to shadow everything he does. It's to read his every word, it's to note down his every announcement, it's to analyse it, it's to talk to as many people as possible about what his policies actually mean in practice, where the flaws are, what the problems are. It's to spot when he's contradicted himself from something he said yesterday to something he said six weeks ago, which by the way he has. It's to analyse the impact of his policies. So it's to shadow him, but also on the flip side, the positive side, is to come up with the overall aims and the policies um, that I would be implementing if I was actual Secretary of State for Housing, because my plan is, I'm sure lots of people's plan is that Labour wins the next general election and then I get to work with all those different housing organisations to actually make sure that every single person has a home that's decent, affordable, um, based on renew fueled by renewable energy, uh, built with environmentally sustainable materials and uh, truly affordable, not pretend affordable. So we've all got that vision, I'm sure, um, but it's my responsibility to pull together the different policy strands and try and make that happen. Fantastic. I'm just going to outline what we're hoping to briefly discuss before we get onto a QA and a um, before eight o'clock for the this evening's clap for carers so um, we'll leave 10 minutes for Q&A that's come in via email what we're hoping to ask you about today Fangham is touching on sort of how how you tackle the different areas um, that face housing so initially we'll ask, I'll ask you a question about housing for domestic violence you know people you know with a lot of the the, the amount of uh, domestic homicides have soared and the number of reports of abuse of I think refuge has suggested has increased by 49 percent and i know you've asked a question in the um house of parliament recently on that topic as well as looking at um, labor's five-point plan that was announced for renters over the weekend and um, that's had you know some interest and touching on homelessness rough sleeping and leaseholders and finally the supply we can do all that in 40 minutes we can do all that yeah we can. but um great so Recently, there was a blog posted by on Red Bricks, Red Brick blog, um, on by president of the former president of Child Institute of Housing, Alison Inman. What what do you think that the government is the government doing enough for um, victims of domestic abuse and the coronavirus, and how does housing play its part in that? Um, I mean, the short answer is I don't think they're doing enough. Um, but the longer answer is they're doing a lot more than I thought they would. And to be fair, I think Jess Phillips, who's our Shadow Domestic Violence Minister, and uh, Nick Thomas Simmons, who's the Shadow Home Secretary, I think they did a brilliant job of presenting the arguments for what was missing in the government strategy, which is they hadn't thought about the impact of 
um, coronavirus and the lockdown on domestic violence. And they also hadn't thought about accommodating people safely who were homeless as a result of domestic violence, given that refugees were backing up. Uh, if you can't, you can't get normally week to week, there's not enough refuge space anyway. But as soon as the coronavirus hit, it was hard to get women actually moved on and out of refuge and to move on or permanent accommodation. And so refugees were backing up and there was nowhere for women to go. And also it was difficult for women to ask for help safely. Government's done a few things to help there. They answered our call for specialist funding that was earmarked particularly for domestic violence services. £10 million, pounds, was it? Yeah, and well, yes, it could have been better. I think that's fair to say. I think we know that. And I certainly do that because that was my, for 26 years before I became an MP, I worked in the field of domestic violence. And for the last 10 years, I worked with perpetrators. So the men that I was working with who were abusive towards their partners, something like the lockdown would be at an absolute time when they would be focusing their power and control even more than ever because a lockdown is in itself a method of control and enforcing it is also so it would have been it would have been ripe for further abuse and for the increase of risk levels but it's also difficult to get help if you are stuck in the house and your abuser is not leaving so i would have liked not i have to say it's not just more cash i think more understanding and as with so much of the coronavirus crisis what we what is getting revealed whether it's domestic violence or rough sleeping or uh, overcrowded overpriced housing or a broken benefit system or broken housing system is you wouldn't start from here would you we've had 10 years of austerity in tory-led governments and they've left their mark most um, services to help people, you know, whether it's drug or alcohol counselling or it's mental health services or it's the welfare benefit system, have been hammered by 10 years of Tory rule. So once you have a crisis like the coronavirus crisis laid on top of it, it exacerbates things that were already there. There was already a crisis in housing for domestic violence victims. The thing that it has done, and I don't think they've made enough of, and I'm working on a way to do that with Jess, is it actually possibly offers an opportunity for them to do more safe removal of perpetrators from the home because of the control strategy of the lockdown. I mean, I think we might have passed the point where that would work really, really well. But some uh, police forces are doing that with their local authorities. They're trying to make sure that where there is what's called a domestic violence protection notice, that the perpetrator is removed and is the one who then goes into the hotel or the temporary accommodation, whatever it is and the family are the woman the victim and children are left say protected at home it's not always possible well it's very encouraging that someone like yourself with domestic violence experience and along with jess phillips are in those two positions to really sort of push that up the agenda and i'm sure all of those in the sector are welcoming um that and um, just moving on to um housing for private renters can you tell us about how a labor government would avoid an eviction tsunami and what's in Labour's recent five point plan to protect renters? The best way of protecting renters, and that was identified really early on in the crisis. So my predecessor, John Healy, who's quite a hard act to follow yeah. uh, under Jeremy Corbyn, had come up with the draft legislation, which I basically built into the plan. And uh, but what we've added is the prevention aspect, because we don't think the universal credit system is good enough. And if you take away the benefit cap and you take away the two child limit and you take away the five week wait and you take away the savings restrictions, you actually open up how much universal credit is available in the, you who it's available to, you make it come quicker and you actually increase the amount that's going into people's pockets in order to keep their families and pay rent. We, at the beginning of the crisis, we could see that just lockdown was going to put a lot of people at financial hardship very, very quickly. So we called for uh, the job retention scheme, or we didn't call it that, but we called for a system of uh, compensation for workers. Mm -hmm. And the government heeded our call, I'm pleased to say. There were obviously gaps, there still are. And then they kept, we called for a self-employment scheme, scheme, and they heeded our call to that. Again, there's gaps. So what Annalise Dodds, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer has been doing, along with Johnny Reynolds, Department for Work and Pensions and myself is we've been identifying those gaps and saying if we could plug those gaps and say that to the government if you plug these gaps you will ensure that most people are able to pay rent and not get into arrears. The other part of that is what's called the local housing allowance which mm -hmm. is that part of universal credit and those people who are on housing benefit the legacy benefit that is capped 
at a certain level. Now, it was capped even lower before the crisis, and we have protested against that for some time. And we asked for it to be increased. It has been increased to 30% of market rents. We would like them to keep it there, not make it temporary. I think they're getting around to that. And we've also asked them to look at increasing it still further. Because if you do make sure that that housing allowance is enough in universal credit, and that the benefit cap itself is taken away, then you should be able to keep most people out of being in arrears. And that's what we would do if we were in government. The other bits that we would do is we'd reform the law on evictions and that's doable both on a temporary basis with quite a small act of parliament which wouldn't take that long to get through you could do what's called a one line one line bill so very very simple one clause um suspending the right of for landlords to evict a tenant if they get into two months of arrears because at the moment that is what's called a mandatory grounds for eviction and that's obviously ridiculous when you've got people who are suddenly not able to pay rent and if everything goes well and we're able to get the economy going again soon, we'll probably be back in work again soon. Hopefully. That's the other thing we need to work on, of course. Why make them homeless? That would cost us more than the extra cost of making sure that we've paid for them to, pay, to make rent. And if you can't, there's no point evicting them. It's much better to allow them to come to an arrangement with their landlord, which the court could enforce the landlord to keep to. Absolutely. I think there's a, a lot to be said around ground eight um, reasons yeah. reason to evict. And yep. it, has, it has come under some sort of criticism lately from yep. those who have called for cancel the rent, who mm. suggest that um, a policy focused on um, what was intended to avoid harsh debt collection as outlined by the likes of Citizens Advice and, and Shelter, you know, warning about gaps in rent. Well, what, what, do you, what do you say to those critics? Well, I say I'd rather people weren't getting into arrears. There are cons so the policy called cancel the rent is actually surprisingly unlabor. It's a really regressive policy because, for instance, um, there are people who are still in work, still able to pay their rent, and if you just cancelled rent, they would also benefit, and they don't need to. Uh, for instance, you know, my my uh, I have a flat in London, which um, all MPs who don't live in London uh, that they, they, we have rented accommodation in London, it would cancel my rent now, that would be completely unnecessary really regressive not necessary at all and not targeted on the people who need it the most whether we like it or not whether we think it's either moral or not there is a legal structure underneath this which is a tenant has signed a contract with a landlord even if it's a rubbish contract with a rubbish landlord who is charging far too much is still legally binding and just cancelling it has consequences in fact there isn't such a thing as cancelling it there's you could decide that you're going to make sure that tenants have enough money to pay rent first and foremost. That's our policy. Mm -hmm. You could decide that, let's say you did decide that there was to be a general rent waiver. Nobody needed to pay rent. Everyone was exempt until the end of the crisis. The landlords, whether we like it or not, would have a legal case against actually either the government or their tenants or quite possibly both. And there have already been legal cases just about the evictions ban. So you'd have to think about who are you going to target it on and how would you compensate landlords for that? And if you take out the entire private rented sector and you cancelled its rent, in fact, if you took out the entire rented sector and you cancelled its rent, we're talking about £7.2 billion a month. Now, just for comparison, it's, that's, that's, you know, that's less than we're spending on the National Health Service a month, but not much. So, you know, we're, we're talking about an enormous amount of money. And as a Labour politician, I can't call for something, I can't call for the government to do something unless I genuinely believe that it's a policy that we would take if we were in government. And I'm not sure that we would, because at the moment, we actually don't know what's ahead of us. So we need to make sure that we're targeting the help on people who really need it. And I would rather give them the money up front so they weren't in arrears. If you also cancel the rent and you didn't compensate the landlords, social landlords like councils and housing associations, okay. some of them would go bust. Some of them, most of them would have to stop building and stop. Well, I mean, they're not building much at the moment anyway, but they would have no money for building. They would have no money for maintenance. The rent for social landlords is what pays for the maintenance and the building. And at the moment, most social landlords are in any case coming to really good and generous arrangements with tenants who are getting into difficulties. It's the private rented sector where we've got a problem. And that's why we need to deal up, deal with it, I think, up front by removing the benefit cap and increasing the local housing allowance.
Yeah, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, there has been a lot of inconsistency around, you know, what tenures are how, and how we treat them. And I think, yeah. you know, for mortgage people who have access to mortgage deferral, they still have to pay that mortgage payments yeah. back with an interest. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is that it will come full circle for landlords if they do have their rent cancelled and you'll have an, an eviction tsunami anyway. Well, you would. And that's the other thing. That's the, you've got to always think about with, with policy making, especially if you're going to ha be in a position where you might have to make this into law and actually watch the consequences for millions of people. And that's the situation I'm in. If we had that policy and a lot of private landlords went bust, I know there are lots of people, including lots of Labour members who go, yippee, that's that's fine. They're, they're evil, exploitative people, which is maybe well be true. But if they go bust, the, their tenants are going to be homeless. Yeah. You know, so we have to think about what would happen after that. Their housing that they owned would be bought up by even probably even greedier landlords. And I think we also have to think about the fact that sometimes, whether we like it or not, people who've been on low pay, often for the last 10 years as a result of terrible Tory cuts, are topping up a very medi medium mediocre income with rent on a property that used to belong to their their mother who's maybe moved in with them and they're renting out their mom's house and that is actually topping up their income now you might say that's wrong you might say that's not okay but we do have to think about those consequences as well but i think the primary thing for me is what would it do for the tenants and who would it target it would be deeply regressive to have a general rent waiver and to come up with a specific rent waiver if you're going to do that and target you might as well pay up front by removing the benefit cap and the local housing allowance increase the local housing allowance well, thanks for that Daniel. um homelessness has seemed to be an eradicated um overnight mm. by moving rough sleepers at risk of covid19 into hotels um, and other types of accommodation and there are some you know great charities that have acted so quickly like housing justice out there to to have allowed that to happen but to what extent is there an exit plan to ensure homelessness and rust sleeping, you know, can continue to have the permanent housing and support they need going forward. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because, okay, there are gaps, by the way, not everyone has been accommodated and people who've become street homeless since the lockdown started are probably not being accommodated. And there are some people who it hasn't worked out for. And then there's all the hidden homelessness, which hasn't necessarily been dealt with. But an important watershed moment happened about six, seven weeks ago when the country as a whole said, everybody in, everybody should have a roof in this crisis. And that meant we went from both major parties, actually, at the last general election, promising to eradicate street homelessness within a period of years. Ours was also a period of years. And we suddenly discovered that if you really, really want to, you can do it over a weekend. And that leads you to this, this, I think a philosophical and also an ethical problem now, which is Labour Council certainly are getting in touch with me to say there is no way that we can go into those hotels at the end of the lockdown and say everybody out. We said everybody in. We can't say everybody out. It's got to be everybody moved on into safe, supported accommodation. Now, these are people who often have really complex needs. And again, like I said earlier, if you were going to have the most resilient way to go into a crisis, it wouldn't be after 10 years of Tory rule. You wouldn't start from here. You know, the resilience that you need to get through a crisis, whether it's in the health service, the social care service, the housing, all of these things, all this crisis has done is exposed terrible flaws and fissures in what was already there. And as it is with the health service and the care service, so too with the services for homeless people, because what we've lost... Uh, all of the things that actually under the last Labour government were increasingly making street homelessness virtually, um, not completely gone, but virtually gone. And that is that shows that it's a political choice. It was a political choice to let it increase. And it was a political choice to say, right, everybody in. And it has to be a political choice to make the plan for what happens afterwards. And I'm afraid to say, in answer to your question, yesterday when the, shadow, the actual housing secretary, Robert Jenrick, made his housing statement and I responded, big disappointment. I've been told there'll be a housing statement. I thought maybe he's got a plan. He's had enough ideas. And he had a plan for estate agents. Okay. There was no plan yesterday for what he's going to do at the end of the lockdown. And when I asked him about it, all he said was he'll be coming to that in due course. This is probably five weeks away. And it was a miracle that we got everybody in over the weekend. It took a phenomenal amount of work. But councils are now really strapped. They are about 10 billion adrift from the actual cost of what they've needed to spend on COVID, including the homelessness accommodation and what the government's given them. The government said spend what it costs 
we'll refund you. It's not happened. So naturally, councils are really worried that they're going to have to come up with all the support services and move on accommodation at the end that will be necessary when a Labour council, because I believe in this, won't go into a hotel and say everybody out. I think that Labour councillors are going to try and find ways of accommodating people and I think that that's what the Tory government's counting on and it makes me very angry because it's not free but it was political choices from the centre from Tory government after Tory government after Tory government that has led us to this point and they don't have a plan so I'll keep going back on him because he knows he's going he knows he's going to be held to account weirdly I think the word not weirdly interestingly maybe I think he's getting a lot of pressure from Tory councillors as well well, I'm not surprised. And for those that might have missed yesterday's um, housing statement, you can watch Thang and Reply to Robert Jenrick on uh, Parliament TV. Um, and you can find that link on the Labour Housing Group Twitter. And um, housing for leaseholders and shared owners. There's been a sort of rise, I think the statistics show us, from the Housing Ombudsman in 2009. Um, the figures were around... I think it was 7,678 combined number of complaints dealt with and inquiries. Fast forward 10 years, that, dub, that number is now 16,300. It's 212% higher than a decade ago. It's 10 years of austerity coming through the housing association sector as well with regards to how um, housing is being managed and complaints to those providers. Is that an issue that needs to be taken up? Oh, goodness me, yes. I mean, if, if what leaseholders are mostly telling me at the moment, the ones who are most vocal uh, to me and my shadow minister, um, Mike Amesbury, who's covering leaseholders and the related issues, what the thing they most tell us about is feeling trapped, uh, feeling ripped off. Uh, quite often because they are, and those who are in um, properties with unsafe cladding feeling quite scared as well. And the two scandals, the leasehold scandal and the cladding scandal, are overlapping scandals because there are people who are paying eye-watering sums, even in the lockdown, for what's called waking watch. And that is no real protection from the fire risks of having really unsafe cladding when what should have happened is that cladding a the cladding never should have been on there in the first place but once it was known it was dangerous we've had two years since grenfell to get rid of it and the government in fact no it's we're really coming up to three years now and the government hasn't taken responsibility in fact in australia i hear that in one state in australia basically the government took on all the liability and they're now basically they've done it they've done the work they take the liability off the leaseholders and they've sued the developers who use the cladding material no. um, now there's problems in there as well but it was a better way than leaving the leaseholders stuck with it and that's kind of typical it's like an emblematic issue for leaseholders is the cladding issue even those who are not affected feel affected because they are experiencing the same problems of being tied into something if you were designing a housing system from scratch if you just landed on the united kingdom as an empty island and said right okay how will we design a housing system you would never come up with the leasehold no. you just wouldn't um, so it's ripe for reform. And if you have a vision, which I do, and I think most of us would agree that everybody has a right to a safe, secure home on a tenure that is appropriate and secure, you wouldn't put leasehold in there and certainly not in the way that it is at the moment. So the problem then is how do you undo it? And I've got various people working on this for me because there's uh, we're as a Labour housing team, we're a team of two at the moment, me and Mike Amesbury. So we have to get other generous folk to help us. And there are various specialists in this area who are working on it for us on how we need to, what we're going to need to do to undo the leasehold scandal. But I have to say, it's one of those scandals that if the Tory government wants to solve it because again it affects Tory voters as well as Labour voters in fact you could argue maybe it even affects more I don't know um, they could if they want to there are apparently solutions that they could do because they're the government they've got civil servants to help them I've just got one researcher yeah. so I, I need I want them to solve this problem quicker and if they don't my intention is that we come into government in four years time touch wood and we know how we're going to do it that's fantastic. I mean, there has been a lot of campaigns recently with um, issues with service charge and yeah, oh, it's outrageous. 
yeah mm-hmm. and i mean there's leaseholds that, that you're locked into those service charges whether you like it or not whether you're getting decent service or not uh you know people who've contacted me said you know it shouldn't be called a service charge there is no service and you have no right to negotiations you got you know barely it's really difficult even to get the records i'm i'm fighting a case for a constituent at the moment of how she can even get the records of what she's paying for what is it that she's supposed to pay for you have the right to request it but not the right to see it you have, to have a, you have to be a barrister just to understand what section you've got to put notice you've got to put in. You do. Mm-hmm. And it's not right that a load of leaseholders have had to become animator barristers to try and get <laughs> a- access to justice. It's not OK, really, is it? No. So, you know, my intention is that we walk into government with a plan for how to fix that straight away. Right. Well, I'd love to start some, some campaign in that. And yes, I think we should. But um, moving on to supply. So ah. we've had some good news from Sadiq yesterday and today. Um, you know, broken a record for new affordable homes, and it's good to see that we're actually building some social, socially rented homes. Um, I think it was around about 17,000 started on site um, over the last year, which is more council homes started than in the last three decades. Um, what, what more could, what would a Labour government do to ensure there's sufficient specialist affordable housing for groups, including key workers and, and those who are elderly? And are there some successes that we should be focused on in terms of, you know, how Labour councils are delivering that? And what targets should we be focusing on? Big questions there. Yeah, big questions. I mean, I think if we get caught up on numbers, as Matt Hancock has found, uh, you end up being a hostage to fortune. I think I'd rather get caught up on an overall aim, which is... I want everyone to have a home that is safe, secure, has access to outdoor space, is fueled by renewable energy, built by environmentally sustainable materials on a tenure that suits them and at a genuinely affordable price. Whether it, Whatever sector you're in, whether you own your own home or you're in the private rented sector or the socially owned sector, whichever part of the socially owned sector you're in, you should be able to have all of those things with legal redress that's affordable and accessible if, you, if those things aren't there. And, and how we... Where the examples are, they are, of course, I would say this, wouldn't I? They are where Labour is already in government. I mean, Sadiq is doing just amazing things in London with his housing team, but so too are other Labour councils up and down the country. The Welsh government as well is doing some absolutely brilliant stuff. I think providing councils with a way of being able to purchase um, uh, off-plan properties that are already built, that are high spec, uh, would have been a much better way of kickstarting the housing markets than the way that Robert Jenrick chose yesterday, which is basically, here you are, estate agents, just run amok. Um, that would have been much better so we could do that and certainly there are uh, Labour local and national governments who are looking at that or are already doing versions of that Um, we could be buying up rented empty sorry empty properties full stop whether or not they're new or not now that again is lockdown perfect I would have thought because we shouldn't really be going around people's homes where they already live now if the government doesn't want to do that that's certainly going to be something that I will be putting into our plan for housing uh, is how we make use of the homes we already have how we make them truly affordable well I don't know about anyone else on this call, but if you've read or partially read or just read the executive summary of the report by the Affordable Housing Commission, I'm working my way through it with the ballpoint pen and the highlighter at the moment. Um, There's a good set of blueprints in there for things that Labour can do in local government and in national government. Obviously, it was an apolitical commission, so there's some things in there I think could have been stronger. Um, But one of the tricks that we have to get under we have to rediscover and reinvigorate i think in ourselves on the social democratic left is the notion of counter cyclical investment that's what governments are actually for governments when times are plenty and people have plenty and if it's well distributed you are there to spread the wealth around and make sure everyone's got opportunity make sure everything's running nicely of course but in times when times are harsh and goodness knows that's where we are now that's exactly when governments are supposed to invest and i think we've seen that even in the last few days in the daily telegraph and the financial times of all papers you know that those uh, allegedly you know not left-wing newspapers are already saying things like look is this right that the government are going to get us out of the coronavirus crisis and then cut things i think if we were in government and I was housing secretary, what I'd be working on now is how we get a plan for investment in those modern day equivalent of Homes for Heroes. So at the end of the Second World War, we had Homes for Heroes. And some of those council homes that were built then have lasted, some haven't. 
yeah. many of them you know were, were the first time that those families had ever had a decent kitchen a decent bathroom an inside toilet and you know that was revolutionary at the time now we're, we're, we're a whole several generations on from that what we need now are homes that are insulated for heroes that are fueled in a way that is going to be renewable and not break the climate change bank you know we we have all of those things to take into account but one way that we could really reward our heroes we're going to go out and clap them at eight o'clock for sure i'm going to go do that you're all going to do that but a lot of the people who are clapping live in really rubbish poor quality overpriced housing and we could have decided and i think the labor party has that one way of rewarding them is to revolutionize the housing market and by revolutionize it i mean you bring in regulations into the private rented sector. You bring in methods of borrowing for local councils and housing associations or leveraging against existing capital in ways that they currently aren't. You make sure that they're compensated for right to buy in ways that, you know, we'll work on the detail, but you make sure that it isn't a net drain on the economy so that we can make the first buyer of preference a social landlord, or if it's a private landlord, one that's going to run it according to well well worked out set of regulations and that affordable stops being a joke word and actually means affordable yeah absolutely i mean and we could be doing that and if we don't if the government don't do that that's what i want to do well it's good it's good to hear that there's a lot of plans in, in the supply side because you know i think there was a the recent uh, social housing select committee mm. to close its consultation recently of which labor housing group did submit a uh, make a submission uh, as well as shouts and i'm sure another number of other organizations have done so as well um there was a cross-party commitment uh, motion last june i think to deliver 155,000 socially rented homes and i know we're a long way away from bottom line numbers, but to what extent do you um see social housing as a predominant factor and a message from josie is asking whether you know do you see a meet intermediate rental homes where say the, the rents are discounted 20 percent of market level as a way to support um you know people on low to middle incomes you know graduates and, and young people that might not necessarily be accessible to social housing i mean i i am really interested in that suggestion and i'm looking at every single suggestion at the moment i mean i also as i said i i have the very good fortune to follow an excellent shadow housing secretary in john healy who'd actually been a housing minister under the last labor government and had done a phenomenal amount of spade work so that i don't start from scratch i don't have to start from zero but i also can't commit i can't write the next labor manifesto now because it's going to be four years from now but what I can do, and what I am doing, is make sure I'm looking at not just where we've got to in the last Labour manifesto, but all the ideas of how we can make that even better. And that's one. I mean, there are all sorts of schemes I think we could be we talking about. I think we need to also be brave on the left and look at the fact that lots of people do want to own their own homes. We, we can't, we, you know, we, we, we talk about the social housing sector and I believe in it. I believe in council housing and I also think that housing associations have got a great role to play as well. I think that the private rented sector has come been allowed to dominate the rental sector by successive Tory governments. And you can see that in the stats over the last 10 years. And the deregulation that's taken place has allowed them to uh, bring down quality rather than increase it in many places. You know, it's not, not every bit, but you know, the, it's, it's become progressively more and more expensive and therefore progressively less, less and less good quality, safe and um, appropriately um, populated. So, Every single idea, I'm going to look at every single one there is and try and make sure that we learn from the best of other countries, other social democratic countries as well. But I also think we might, like I said, I think we might need to be brave on the left and say, what does it mean, the fact that so many people will always want to own their own home? And how does that fit into a Labour vision? What, what, what are your thoughts on the first homes proposal? That's a question coming from mm. Fabian Mark McVitie. I think the consultation for that ran from February to March this year. Um, have you had any thoughts on that? I know it's sort of a new first homes proposal. I'm not sure they bottomed out who it's actually for, but no, I haven't had time to spend much time on that yet because, like you say, the consultation was only earlier this year, and then suddenly we were into the COVID crisis, and I only became shadow housing secretary uh, four weeks into the crisis, I think. And so most of what I've been doing so far has been trying to work out how we get through this and trying to build the. Uh, 
broad strokes of what the vision is going to look like and i haven't got into that enough but i've just written it down on my notebook to make right. sure i do um but i think it is it sort of taps into the fact that we do need to think about what people's first homes are and how they get to them and how they afford them and there's no use having a structure that we've got at the moment the one we're living in at the moment is one where people have to if they want to buy their own home save for a long time whilst they're still living in very expensive rented accommodation so it needs to be something that cuts through those but i promise i'll have a look at it right i've got another, a long list <laughs> yeah <laughs> long um, another question has come in from sam dalton and sam says the covid19 lockdown has brought into sharp focus the fact that many older people live on their own yeah. breathing yeah. social isolation feelings of loneliness do you think housing policy has a role in addressing this? And if so, how? So, for example, he's put here, would you, using housing policy to create more socially integrated communities or building more housing for older people within retirement communities be helpful? Well, the short answer is obviously yes. Um, I mean, I think we should be designing the sort of housing um, that can be flexible over a lifetime. Um, and my one of the things on my mind at the moment is how we design the homes that we need for 2050 not just the homes we need for 2030 um, because we will have an increasing uh, elderly population it will be a larger and larger proportion as, as you know healthcare gets better and life expectancy grows so we need to design homes that can be used flexibly so people can live um, intergenerationally in new ways I mean I come from a from a South Indian background so intergenerational living in my family is just like normal um, and I think it's something that in this country we've tended to atomize our family lives and you're absolutely right that that the covid crisis has been it's been like a blue blue dye exposure of so many things that were probably wrong all the way, all, for some time about how we live and not only that older people live alone very often but often a long way from their family who have moved away and come and visit maybe once or twice a year and that goes for me too i mean my, my mom was in yorkshire it's it's too far away from my liking and really really feel it now so i think we could there are all sorts of schemes like there's a really interesting one in um in the netherlands which is partly dealing with a problem of student accommodation but it's also dealing with the problem of older people living on their own which is with a really carefully vetted scheme and all sorts of support put in place where st a student will live with an older person and they have to agree that they actually do live there and they are uh, they don't necessarily eat all their food together but they're living in the same property and that means there is someone there they have to do a certain they do a certain amount of socializing together they're interviewed carefully to put them together and and i've heard of that being a, a, a way of helping with not just uh, intergenerational uh, with with the loneliness of older age and the vulnerability that comes with that and the isolation that comes with that but also the fact that there's a whole generation of young people getting to know a different generation of people and that's no bad thing mm -hmm. I think we also need to think about how we, just how we design communities and you know just there are too many housing estates across the country that haven't thought through okay where is where are people going to safely grow old how are they going to walk be able to walk to the doctor's surgery how are they going to get exercise how does that integrate into seeing their grandchildren why are we not designing places where there is space and economic scope for a new family to be able to afford a home in the area where their grandparents are um you know what that's how well i think we should have that vision of how we want to live couldn't agree more um the next question is regarding the lgbt community in housing so and um, this is a question that's come in from Hunter Powers, which is in regard to housing benefit. And um, has there been any consideration into removing the age cap for people under 35 who are restricted to shared accommodation rates? As this insinuates those that are under that age should be living in shared accommodation, but everyone has their own individual circumstances, which may warrant them the need to live in a self-contained unit. Um, this individual, as a, as a trans person under that age, has found it difficult sharing accommodation yeah. in the past due to variations of issues, including discrimination. And they feel there's no security if they lose a job and um, the benefit wouldn't cover the housing costs. And some of them have ended up homeless because of that. Um, you know, is there, you know, what, what, what can we, what could the Labour government do with regards to housing benefit? And what should that age cap be limited to shared accommodation? I think this is 
something which speaks to a bigger problem, which is the problem of the private rented sector being so overpriced. Uh, if you so if you take all of that apart and you say, well, there is the restrictions on housing benefit and there's the age cap, in actual fact, what's underneath that is unaffordable housing. And as well as in, in this in this situation, and I'm really sad to hear that it's it's also someone who doesn't feel safe to share. And I think that there's two there's two issues there. One is obviously about discrimination. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I, I feel really sad at the thought that people are feeling forced to live alone rather than choosing to. I think there is a difference between making a positive choice and feeling unsafe to do anything else. But the other side of that is why is housing so unaffordable that that fear is a really live and real fear. And so what I would want to do is not dis not not count out the idea of reforming housing benefit, because I think it does need reforming and is the universal credit that local housing lands, as I said. But I'd also want to come at it the other way around, which is try to make housing truly affordable and make it good quality and make it, as I said, in relation to older people, flexible so that it would be reconfigured in different ways at different times in people's lives and at different stages in 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 the community. So I'm sad that I'm sad that there are people who clearly do feel unsafe to live with other people. And I'd want it always to be a positive choice, but I'd also like to make sure that housing is truly affordable. Great. The next question has come in from Abdi Diwali. Abdi asks, recent changes to planning policy by the Tories means that there's no requirement for planning permission for single storey rear extensions of up to six metres mm. on terraced or semi-detached homes. What changes would would you like to, would Thang and like to see in planning policy to make new affordable homes easier and quicker to build? Well, I'm going to plead um, with that question because planning policy is, I mean, I'm going to just share with you a little, little bit of information. The previous Labour housing secretary, who, as I said, had been a housing minister and so housing was his specialist area, but he'd also been in post for quite a long time and he was the head of a team of four. I'm, I think, four weeks in post. I'm the head of a team of one and planning is, is on Mike's brief. So he's mm -hmm. been the one getting his head around where the planning policy is going at the moment and not me. And so I'm going to I'm going to pause that one, I'm afraid, and I'm going to pass it back to Mike and I'm going to ask him and I'm going to ask him to get back to to you, Chris, if that's possible, or see if I can tweet something out about that in the next few days, because I think it's a really, really good question to which I do not have the answer. And I think it's just better if I'm honest about that. Fantastic. I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done in the planning side. Yeah. Of, you know, I think Centre for Cities, uh, particularly yeah. another young Fabian called Ant Breach, who's... Yeah some quite fascinating work in there might be worth much. i mean i think there's a whole load of things that we're going to want to do to the planning system and and i i am really interested in in the six meter extension um question i think that's it, it speaks again perhaps to the the if i'm going to i'm going to have an attempt at answering part of it anyway um but i'm going to answer it from a position of belief rather than secure knowledge which is I'm worried at the idea that we are building on top of what limited green and open space we already have. And we've really seen in this crisis the impacts on people who don't have access to green and open space. And we've seen in parts of our cities and in parts of cities in other, in other parts of the world that if you allow planning permission to crowd out the natural light, to, to, a, to create a building which crowds out the existing natural light limited as it is in towns and cities and the green space that there is which is limited as it is in towns and cities then we are creating other sorts of problems um, but I don't have a technical answer for you all I can say is I'm really glad you asked me and I'm going to go away and ask Mike Amesbury to tell me <laughs> what he's doing about it. Fantastic and um, the next question is from Jackie Peacock, and it is quite specific to um, the ground eight uh, yep. rears. Mm -hmm. And she's suggested um, that a ban on possession should continue in, until the legislation to abolish Section 21 has passed and come into force. And could we propose that, and this is very technical jargon, so for those that don't understand, um, Section 8 grounds for rent arrears should be discretionary so at least that will give the courts discretion yeah. to order payback yeah. over two years or longer 
um, I mean, what the tenants' ability to pay. Yeah, well, that's labour policy. In fact, we've gone a bit further than that. And we j we've said that it actually shouldn't be grounds for arrears during the life of the crisis. And the draft legislation that we've, we've presented, actually, it does do that. And it gives repayment period over two years. But that doesn't stop it being longer if the court orders it to be longer. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, I just think that grounds eight at the moment, the which is for those that don't know if you are two months in arrears on your rent and your landlord decides to go to court once the ban on evictions is lifted or even before then they could start they could issue notice it's mandatory for the court to issue a possession order and that means that there's absolutely no discretion whatsoever for a court to take into account any special circumstances i think at the very least it should be discretionary but actually what we've done is we've said that it should not be grounds for the life of the crisis and then the court should have the discretionary power to order repayments over a period of time and and to what extent have you been working with the likes of um giles Pika, who I, I, I had the pleasure of seeing him speak at an all-party par parliamentary group on leasehold and commonhold reform, and he seems a very knowledgeable man in the area. Um, is there is there is there much discussions with the likes of him in terms? Oh, most of certainly. I think I've probably emailed Giles and Justin virtually every day since I became shadow housing secretary, <laughs> and uh, but others as well. I've 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 had the great pleasure and honour of of meeting well virtual meeting. An awful lot of great labour or left-wing housing lawyers and barristers and specialists in this area who've all taught me a huge amount in a short space of time um, and taken me from an area of a, a level of, of knowledge of housing which was good enough to be a decent Labour MP I hope and I had a lot of knowledge about domestic violence and housing law and homelessness and uh, homelessness legislation but less on some of the other aspects and yeah I've talked to them regularly there's some other but I'm sure there are other great uh, lawyers um, that you that people on the call will know of and so if, I, other lawyers are also available but I am extremely already extremely semi-dependent on on Giles and Justin um, and others that I've been speaking to yeah Right. Um, <clears throat> just going through some of the other questions now. Um, this is one from Christian Newsom, who lives in Lower Stoft. And the new build of social housing is low in this town and the surrounding area, which is causing significant pressure on the local market. The East Suffolk Council keeps buying land for housing and leaving it redundant for, year, for, redundant for years at the taxpayer's expense. What would a Labour government do to build more council on affordable housing and to stop councils? That's not usually one you hear, but if that is the case, concerning build not sitting on undeveloped land. Yeah, well, I'm really, really not in favour of land banking, whether it's uh, socially owned land banking, and I've not come across that before, um, or privately owned land banking, which I have. And uh, the Welsh Government have got some interesting plans on this. I'm just looking at my notes from a discussion this morning. Um, I... I really think that uh, once you've got a piece of land that could be used for housing, particularly if it's got planning permission, then what we should be doing is building on it uh, and building good quality homes and neighbourhoods and not just sitting on it waiting for the price to go up, the value to go up. So there are various methods you could use. And as with this question, so with so many, and probably the ones for the next 10 minutes as well, I'm definitely not going to write the next Labour manifesto today. So I can't give you specific policy answers, but I can tell you um, that I know that there are lots of different ways that you could suck, um, suck that process out and actually stop land banking. Uh, you could make it uh, so that you withdraw the planning permission. You can make it so that you can tax the value. You could legislate for it so you tax the increase in value once the property is built and sold or developed. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do. Uh, one thing I will not do is say that that's OK, because it's obviously not OK just to leave the land sitting there especially in a city and a town like you know like Lowestoft I mean I know Lowestoft it, it they really need the housing and I think introducing a, a principle which is something that I'm really interested in introdu introducing a principle that we decide as a country that everybody should have a decent home as affordable safe secure all those things that i've been saying throughout the last hour if we do, if we decide as a country that that is a principle that should underpin planning policy and land policy then from that flows that you shouldn't be allowing councils or private developers just to sit there and wait for the value to go up and that there are various legal mechanisms and tax mechanisms and all sorts of other routes that you could use in order to stop that because it should be being built on so i'm just going to sort of try and round this off over the next call it three to four minutes so we'll give us time to get out there um 
Thangam, what, what role do you think socialist societies like the Labour Housing Group, like the Young Fabians, can play in helping formulate new policy? And you know, how do you recommend people get best involved or politically active to, to help impact that change? Oh, I mean, it, it's that it's so important that I'm trying trying to express some of the best routes. I mean, first first start, I've already met virtually online members of the Labour Housing Group, and I'm looking forward to doing another event like this for other members of the Labour Housing Group. And I think we could now we've learned how to do Zoom and webinars and Zoom conferences. And the other day, I was even put into a small group. I didn't even know that was possible. It was amazing. Suddenly we were all in small groups doing small group work. Now, now I know that that's possible. I think that that's opened up a whole other world of policy development and policy discussion. Like every single question that people have asked this evening, I would really like it if we could actually have a discussion about them and sort of say, OK, so those of you who are interested in leasehold reform, can you just go off for 10 minutes and talk about it and then come back and tell me what you think and have some specialists in on that discussion? I think in, in Fabians, you have a tradition on the, uh, on the left, in, in Fabians generally and young Fabians in particular, of helping to come up with really um, well thought through and considered policy ideas in well written formats and well thought through um, presentations. So I would like to carry on working with you and I'd like us to spend some more time on each and everything that you've discussed this evening but I also think it's not it should housing policy in the Labour Party shouldn't come from the shadow secretary of state it comes from CLPs and constituency Labour parties discussing things it comes from groupings like socialist societies in particular specializing and working on particular areas which I know both young Fabians and Labour housing group do deciding that you will do something in particular but maybe that we talk about it and we and I say to you I'd love it if you could do this and you you say no we want to do this and I say well okay well why don't we do this bit together and then you come back and challenge me with it and say well we've come up with this idea what do you think I'll think other ways get involved in national policy forum I had my first national policy forum meeting a couple of weeks ago that is a forum which I know over the last you know some people have not felt able to get involved in and others have there is such a thing as the for national policy forum on housing local government and transport it's going so I think get involved and and get me along to some cons virtual constituency meetings as well. I'd love that. That'd be great. Just to let everyone know, the um, if you haven't joined Labour Housing Group, do, do. so. The next Q&A session with Dag and Debonair is on Wednesday the 27th. Um, and if you want to contribute to a blog, um, Red Brick Blog is now um, up and running on its new website. And Steve Hilditch and I will welcome people for, to, to put any discussions and debate forward. Um, hopefully, if there's anything that's been discussed tonight that you agree, disagree, have any suggestions, get it up on the blog. I'm sure the likes of Thangham and others will be interested in reading your piece, as you've seen today. So. Fantastic engagement from the uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Housing. So, Thangham, I'll give us two minutes to get to our balconies or out the door. But um, thank you so much for, for joining Young Fabians today. It's been fantastic. Thank you all so, so, so much. It's been great. And thanks for a really, really stimulating evening. And I've got a lot written down in my notebook to follow up. See you right. all again soon. Take care.